Hi everyone, welcome to Anesthesia Coffee Break. I'm Lahiru. And I'm Stan. And today we're going to cover another really common topic here, which is what factors influence the mixed venous CO2 tension and briefly explain how these factors exert their influence. Uh, this is an old, old question, but just represents a lot of the principles of good short answer question writing and delivery. So yeah, let's get started. A usual disclaimer, well, this is just real general medical advice for a first part exam. Please, if you're treating a patient, don't take this as your sole point of information. And so, yep, let's get into the intro and get started. How long, how long since our last episode? It's been a few weeks. Yeah. Like, like two months? It could be that long. <laughs> hey, has it been two months since our last episode? It could be two months. It's so Stan, in the, easy time, in, hasn't it? in the last two months, what performance tip do you have for us, considering that we lacked performance output for this podcast. <laughs> Come on. Come on, La. That was just baiting, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. I'll tell you what's been really, really exciting. So yeah. um, you are part of the Northwest training scheme and we managed to have a very high success rate for our primary exam. Yes. And not only that, we also, um, in fact, Mason, who was on our our podcast who's vibing yeah did so well that he achieved the renton prize and so congratulations to mason yeah. and then oh, Catherine as well who we vibed as well on our podcast uh, she this, achieved the merit for the this primary sounds like exam. a sign if you get vibed on our podcast chances are you'll get some kind of prize well it's what is it 50 percent so far isn't it so that's a very high success rate so for all those who have been uh five on our podcast yeah and and the, one of the things um that i sort of learned from them and it's been a really um, eye-opening experience uh, sort of reflecting on their study journey is with the idea of a study group i think for us you know and traditionally what i think of a study group is you know ma- minimum two maximum five and sort of try to keep it um, you know, the numbers within it sort of try to keep it manageable. But having having a chat to them about how they constructed their study group, especially during the revision period, what they did was they actually allowed a lot of a lot of other group members to come in. And, you know, they allowed, um, so they were a group of four and then they allowed two others. And they also allowed another trainee who was unsuccessful um, in their previous sitting to come into their study group where they would meet weekly and they would have a very structured way of um, going through that study group uh, process during that um, during those times. And you know what I learned from them is that being compassionate and being kind and generous really helps not only others but it also helps yourself as well to succeed. And I can tell you that you know all of them, so all, all those group members, including the ones, including the one who was unsuccessful, they all passed and they all did so well. And hearing that story really sort of inspired me to rethink about the idea of a study group. And you know what, maybe we don't need to be three or five, maybe that, um, you know, it can be larger. And really the key thing is having a structure in place that allows, you know, everyone within the group, no matter how big it is, to be able to participate and have a voice and learn from one another. And, you know, it was just so inspiring to hear their story. And I just want to share it with everyone out there that, you, you know, studying for this exam, be kind, be compassionate. You know, if someone doesn't have a study group, take them in because yeah. you, you have that opportunity to teach them. And when you teach them, yeah. you learn yourself. And they've also got the opportunity to have that bond with yourself and also to learn from you as well. So it's, it's really a win-win situation for everyone. Yeah, you're right. I mean, every now and again, you just hear of heartbreaking stories that, you know, someone's maybe not from a certain hospital or they don't really know the group that come from interstate. And, you know, just the fact that their circumstance is just really unfortunate. They're left out of, you know, the, the study circles and suddenly they're doing this mammoth task, running a marathon without any supports. Um, and yeah, the, I mean, I really like that that's what they did because I, I suspect that there's far more to gain by being inclusive. And, you know, like you said, if someone is external and they've got some other ideas or maybe they need a bit of help the fact that you're teaching them that really helps like you know hopefully um, you know usually people who are on the peripheries of of the system 
are trying pretty hard because they really need to prove themselves and get in. So hopefully, you know, that's you right. Get an yep. equal um, you know, in advantages of um, bo- both things happening. Mm. Yeah, and and look, I think that uh, this should be one of our personal projects to maybe mm. you know link up trainees around Australia who who are isolated because mm. one of the one of the things um, one of the positive things that have come out from the last couple of years, which have been difficult for all of us, is that we're a lot closer than what we actually think. And I guess you know with technology nowadays, it allows us to connect with one another. Uh, so easily, you know, through this whole Zoom process, mm. you know, you're you're on, you're on, you're down the road. I'm here. Yeah, but this yet is, at the same time, we're like, like sitting next to each other. You didn't need to drive, find parking. We had to set up multiple cameras or something. This is actually easier on many levels. <laughs> I mean, let, let's do that was, right now. I was meant so. to come over your place, but uh, I've, got the, right. I've got the kids on school holidays at the moment. So lovely. Um, this is this is. Uh, this is my way of looking after the kids. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, let's do it. Let's, I mean, let's action that now. So if anyone's out there who doesn't have a study group, you know, contact us, Lahiru and Stan at gmail.com. That's L-A-H-I-R-U and Stan, normal spelling at gmail.com. Um, and we'll put in the show notes. But yeah, if you don't have a study group and you need some help with this, we, we will try to link you up with people. And I think there'll be lots of people who want that opportunity to bring someone on, someone who's got extra skills, someone who they can teach and that can, you know, teach them as well. Uh, and, you know, let, let's, let's face it, the connections you make in your journey of training, whether it was, you know, high school or university or anesthetic training, these are the friendships that you will often, have, like the connections you'll keep for years to come. And, you know, one day, it's one of those things like constantly now, like, you know, I've, 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 I've filled my plate with the work I can get and I'm constantly giving away work to, you know, friends of mine and people that, I, that I've known over time. And it's a really nice thing to be able to do as well. And, you know, people have done that for me in the past. And, you know, I've recently I have to give up some lists and they're really great lists. And uh, yeah, just, yeah, have some, have some. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think uh, that's the lesson to, to learn um, that being kind and generous really helps not only the world, but also yourself as well. I think that's a really good philosophy to have. Yeah. Good, good. All right. So now you've got your topic, which is about mixed venous CO2. So do you want to tell the audience about the question and how yeah. you would go about uh, going through that? Yes, this is a pretty common question. Again, a very core topic. Um, so what factors influence the mixed venous CO2 tension and briefly explain how these factors exert their influence? So what I liked about this question, again, is a really good example of where you can put some very common principles. So, you know, starting with normal values, how you would measure this, and then giving a classified answer and maybe some equations that are valid. The first question that obviously comes to mind is what would be a normal um, mixed venous CO2 content or, or partial pressure? Yeah, that's right. So, you know, your normal uh, CO2 tension would be 45 millimeters mercury, and the yep. content in your venous side would be that 52 mils of CO2 per 100 mils of blood. And it's kind of this interesting thing where, you know, each minute you've got this five liters of arterial blood and that has 48 mils. But then when it goes through the tissues, the tissues add that extra 200 mils of CO2. And then the venous content is 52 mils per 100 mils after that. Um, So, you know, it's carrying this 2,600 mils of CO2 to the lungs every minute. um, And that's where the CO2 is expired. So then 200 mils expired. Um, and then the, I guess the corollary of that is like 250 mils per minute of oxygen goes into your tissues, 200 mils of CO2 go that every minute. Yeah. Great. And the maths works out um, correct, doesn't it? So what you're saying is that there's, in the arteriocyte, it's 48 mils uh, per deciliter, mm. which then increases to 52 mils per deciliter. So that's a difference of four mils per deciliter. Mm. And then if we assume that your cardiac output is five liters per minute, that would mean that your CO2 is 200 mils. And so the, the math works out really well. Yeah, that's right. 50 times four equals 200. Because yep. there's 50 lots of 100 mils. Yes. Equals, you know, 50 At- times 100 equals 5,000. And that's your And then the output. oxygen consumption um, is 250 mils here, yes. which would mean that uh, your um, respiratory caution is 0.8. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? The, the, the <laughs> symmetry of maths that you get through physiology. Yeah, it actually works. And it's kind of nice to dig back into these numbers because like, like we mentioned before with memory, if you remember just one number, that's hard to remember. It's just a number. But if you tie that number to multiple things, 48 to 52, four difference, four mils times, you know, 
50 lots of 100 mils, mm. that equals 200, and link it back to 250 mils per oxygen, and mm. then the respiratory mm. quotient of 0.8. These are all just a sequence of events. It's a chain reaction of beautiful mathematics and physiology that just work. Very nice. <laughs> Very nice. And, and you've got your mixed venous uh, CO2 at 45 millimeters of mercury. What would be what will be the arterial CO2 that you remember? So it's it's going yeah. to be less, but how much more or less do you have it in, in your brain? Yeah, so 40 is the number I, I usually take. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And that's nice and easy, isn't it? You go from arterial of 40 to a mixed venous of 45. I think those numbers work, work really, really well. And actually um, that ties well to, if you were to draw a graph here, I remember we all learned the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, which is that kind of semi-sigmoidal type curve. And then I remember when I was asked to draw the CO2 curve, I was like, oh my God, panic. How do I do this? And mm. literally you just draw four, you know, four numbers, 40 mm. and 45, uh, sorry, yep. on the y-axis, 40, sorry, x-axis 40 and 45, y-axis yep. 48, 52, draw yep. a couple of points and, you know, draw those lines and show the transition between, you know, the first dot intersection to the next dot intersection. Um, and that's in, that's pretty clearly demonstrated in West's respiratory physiology. Yep, yep. Okay, so what, what you're, so just to summarize, you've got the partial pressure on the x-axis and you've got content on the y-axis and then the way you work it up. So for the arterial side, you've got a partial pressure on the arterial side of 40 millimeters of mercury mm. with a content of 48 mils per deciliter. So 40 and 48 would be your first, um, would be your first, what, how do we call it? Axis yeah. or point? Yeah, point, yeah, first um, point. Yeah, point. the first point, yeah. And then your second point, you'd have your mixed venous CO2, which with a partial pressure of 46 or 45, apologies and a mix, uh, vein, uh, sorry, a con CO2 content of 52. So 45 and 52 would be your second point. Yes. Yep. And then you just draw your two curves there. But also understanding that they're, they're two different curves because of the Haldane effect, isn't it? So Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. <laughs> and there's a few very points, nice. I think. Good. I mean, that's, that's an excellent tip. Excellent tip. I think sometimes, you know, when you've got these uh, questions and you, and you can't remember it, just go back to, I guess, points of um, references that you know, and then sort of work it out from there. That's a really, really good tip. And also I've got this number of 45, but actually I think you're right, 46 potentially. Oh, it doesn't matter. You know, I think 45 is fine. And you know, 45, 46, you know, for me, I think that as long as you're, as long as you're sort of within the range, it's, mm. it's okay. And, and certainly I think for using 45 for mixed venous, uh, partial pressure CO2 is fine. But yes, you're, you're right that Brandis will say 46. Um, but you know what? One millimeter of mercury is not going to be life changing, is it? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> not good. good. Not good. And then, you know, for the audience, like, how is mixed venous blood? You know, when we talk about mixed venous blood, like, where is it measured? What are we talking? Yeah. Where, where's this blood coming from? Common thing. Every single time you get a question, always figure out or ask your, or ask your bosses or supervisors, how do I actually actually get that reading? Because you want to be able to use this in real life. Uh, so if you ever do cardiac surgery in some you know, major institutions, they'll always float a Swan-Gans catheter or a pulmonary artery catheter. And so that's the formal way of you know, uh, extracting mixed venous blood because you don't want it just from you know, the right heart, like a CVC or peripherally from the venous system because that doesn't account for all the different venous and capillary beds. You want mm -hmm. the confluence of all of those in the heart, which is essentially sampled at the pulmonary artery level. Yep, mm. fantastic. And so what are the factors that would, um, I think you sort of mentioned it coming from sort mm. of the peripheral tissues, but what are the factors um, or other factors which would affect that CO2 levels? Yeah, so I guess this comes to the meat of the question. And so if you think of that formula, PaCO2, mm -hmm. alveolar CO2 is really just a function of you know, CO2 production. So as CO2 production increases, your CO2 increases and also alveolar ventilation. So mm. alveolar ventilation increases, CO2 decreases. So PaCO2 yeah. is proportional to CO2 production and inversely proportional to alveolar ventilation. And that's where we can get into the kind of the detail. I would, in a short answer question, I'd put the title of this, uh, you know, on every half page or every full page and then start writing on each page the detail about this. Yep. So you'd have that formula there just to frame um, your answer. And then from yeah, there you right. have factors that affect CO2 production and mm -hmm. then factors that would affect alveolar ventilation. 
Exactly. And, and so, you know, the common way, again, this is my mnemonic or my way of remembering this is mm. factors that cause hypoventilation. Hypo you can start at the brain and then go all the way down into the okay. lung tissue itself. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, maybe you've got anything that depresses your respiratory center, whether it's anesthesia, drugs, maybe a, a you know, tragic stroke or some other cranial lesion. Great. Mm. That depresses centrally a respiration next level upper motor neuron lesion so anything that affects you know the, the upper motor neuron lead, upper motor neurons that will affect this as well then you've got yeah. your lower motor neurons your nerves so these are lesions um, of your you know phrenic nerve uh, for example for your diaphragm or maybe even your yes. other in, in, intercostal muscles in other ex extreme circumstances but trauma motor neuron disease maybe um, ms my uh, gillian barre syndrome so now we've gone down through all the nerves now we get to the, where does the nerves end? The neuromuscular junction, great. What can affect that? It could be, you know, muscular blockade with, um, you know, muscle relaxants or maybe myasthenia gravis. Mm. Um, finally, you can go into the muscle itself uh, and that will be all of your non-lung factors. Uh, so maybe there's just some kind of constriction around like a, you know, maybe a circumferential burns or some kind of restrictive chest wall disease, maybe obesity even, um, or ascites or pregnancy or whatever it is. Uh, maybe even there's just fatigue due to increased workload. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, within, within the lung tissue itself, think of all the ways that you might have decreased compliance or increased airways resistance or, you know, increased work of breathing or something like that. And that could also affect and cause hyperventilation. I can see, I can see why you won the merit for the, uh, for the second part, uh, lads. Uh, such a good <laughs> list of clinical causes. And, you know, the way that my brain works is very different to that. And, mm. you know, I, I'm, I think I'm still stuck in sort of the primary, um, <laughs> so I do a lot of primary <laughs> teaching, the, the primary way of thinking about this. So that, um, you know, when I think about alveolar hypoventilation, I think about the formula, which is your respiratory rate multiplied by, in brackets, tardive volume minus your physiological dead space. And then within those things, I think about what would cause the reduction in respiratory rate, which is what you've said, um, what will cause a reduction in tidal volume, which is compliance and resistance, and then what would um, increase ah. your physiological dead space, which um, you've also discussed as well. And so, so actually, I, I like your method, because as in from a first part point of view, if you target the equation of respiratory rate, alveolar ventilation, and then compliance, you're actually going into the respiratory physiology aspects rather than the clinical mm. aspects so that might actually be more effective potentially well yeah I think, I think it works well both ways and i think um you know i think it's good to actually have both ways just to give you that flexibility of thought yes uh, and and to also understand that you know the way that you think about this is very clinical based uh in terms of coming from going from the top to the bottom mm. and then there's also another way which, which you can also think about it in terms of the formula as well mm. um and i i think having that flexibility of thought it, it's really helpful and as you can see you know it it's uh it gives you actually good preparation for the for the second part uh, exam which is yeah. actually what the first part is trying to prepare you for yeah is it oh <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was just a hurdle did, of pain did you know that <laughs> no, i thought it was just a hurdle to make us suffer a little bit <laughs> right. oh, good stuff okay, um good. now um how about um apneic oxygenation what's what's the deal with What's to do with that? Yeah, look, it's just it's just interesting that you know when you when you run any kind of, where, where you keep someone safe with oxygen, you know, by oxygenating them either with high flow nasal prongs or maybe you just got the the tube in and say the like in in, in this example in thoracic surgery sometimes the surgeon wants the lungs off and you keep the lungs off but you're still putting oxygen in mm. and now you've got complete I guess annihilation of ventilation um, and the CO two rises and the CO two rises pretty predictably. I remember doing calculation on some ridiculous apneic time of like 20 minutes and the CO2 went from, you know, it's pre -op or pre apnea 40 millimeters mercury after 20 minutes, it was literally four times 20. So that's 80. So it gone up from 40 plus 80 to 120 on the, on the gas. And it was just crazy. Predictive. Wow. It, was, it was almost to the, to the measurement because I thought, right. okay, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to actually time this and measure this. And it was, it was amazing how accurate it was. Yes. Yeah. I've always wondered about that because I understand yet yeah, that they talk about the um, rise of CO2, which is about two to three yeah, millimeters of mercury for every minute. And, um, you know, for me, I always think about after at some point, surely there's buffering that takes place. Hmm. Um, 
you know, at some point, which can compensate for the increase in CO2 so that maybe it's, it, um, it, it does sort of plateau off, but there you I, go. I, so I think, you had it consistently this, rise to there. I think this takes into account all of that because this, this is a composite mm. measurement. I, you know, I think it initially is yep. higher than low than averages at four or something like that. I can't remember the UK. Okay. No, good stuff. I've got, I've got the number four stuck in my head, so I'm just going to go yeah. with that. And, and so just out of interest, you know, with the cases that you've done ethnic oxygenations for, so you said the mm. th thoracics was one, wasn't mm. it? Yeah. Any other, any other cases that you regularly do apneic oxygenation for? Yeah, inter interesting that anytime, anytime the patient needs to stop their chest wall movement for yes. either anesthetic or surgical reasons. So that's, that's the yes. first principle. And so you yes. can imagine all these cases, they're doing any kind of thoracic activity where you, know, you, you, you really just want to absolutely still feel fantastic yes. um, which is essentially thoracic cardiac surgery when they're really getting into you know opening the chest is synonymy or maybe they're doing some really tricky uh you know coronary coronary grafts or yes. in uh, ent surgery so you know sometimes with airway surgery you need the surgical the surgeon needs complete surgical access and so mm. you just can't get there you don't have any tube in you don't even have a hansack or one of those jet ventilation style devices you just got to take everything out and just wait and maybe you know give some high flow nasal or just even mm. or even nothing sometimes uh and then i guess the other times you would use it apneic is um you know difficult intubations where you're, you're you know this is not ideal but you're just ready for the fact that this intubation is going to take ages and for anesthetic yep. reasons you cannot ventilate therefore you'll hopefully have some high flow nasal prongs going in get some kind of apneic oxygenation and then take your time, take a bit more time nice. with the tube. How, how can I that? ask, yeah, no, can I ask, when you do it with the tube, um, let's say for a thoracic case, do you, do you change your oxygen flows at all? Like, do you increase yeah. your flows or do you, do you still leave it at like one, one or two liters? I definitely um, increase my flows, yeah. I, I mean, okay, from yeah. My, from my point of view, diffusion's a big thing, right? Like whether you're ventilating or not, like if you put six liters, that's got, that six liters has to go somewhere. So I, I've definitely increased yes. my and then it okay. surprised me because I thought maybe diffusion and just the normal, it was a you know, motion of particles and gases would cause an ex exhalation of CO2. Uh, you know, if the flows are high enough, mm. there should be diffusion of CO2 from the blood to the alveoli and then, then ox ox gas flow causing enough turbulence to wash out some CO2. So I was surprised that, yeah, my numbers you know, didn't were, decrease were that further. high. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Well, I think that I think that there's obviously a, some degree of CO2 wash. I agree with you, but probably not to the extent where it's able to actually get out all that CO2 that's there. But I would I would certainly think that um, you know if you're having sort of gas in that that diffusion of gases would occur. Yeah. Um, no, that's that's uh, no, that's <laughs> super interesting. And okay, now 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 for the second bit, which is uh, CO two production. So, what kind of things have you got that increase CO two production? Yeah, so I guess uh, firstly, again, a normal value we mentioned CO two production is roughly two hundred mils per minute, and it, it's increased with anything that will increase metabolic rate. So, think of septic states and fever. Um, potentially, the anesthetic really relevant one is malignant hypothermia. And so just mentioning a few of those things, maybe thyrotoxicosis is another common one that's mentioned. This will increase metabolic rate, therefore increase the amount of CO2 product, production, and that could increase your mixed venous CO2 tension. Yep, yep. And can I ask, when you've got a rise in your mixed venous CO2, would you also expect a rise in your arterial CO2 as well? What, what, are, you, what are your thoughts on that one? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. If you if I if a patient is breathing normally, mm. the the you know that your respiratory centers are so sensitive to CO two increase that they'll just increase your minute ventilation. So you just wouldn't expect it in normal physiological circumstances when there's no limit to your sensors, your respiratory yep. center, and your ability to respond, your effectors, your you know respiratory system, your muscles, your ventil ventral apparatus, your lungs. Yeah, you. I don't think you'll get a rise in PA, PA CO two. Mm up to a certain yep. point. Um, and but anesthesia is always in extreme. anesthesia where perhaps you're not um, changing the ventilation or you've got your ventilation fixed and not matched to mm. what would be an appropriate ventilation uh, for mm. someone with a high CO2, you, you could possibly see that uh, exactly. you know, transfer off to an, a rise in your arterial CO2. And, what, and what I, what, what's really interesting about this is then that 
it's one of those times in medicine that rarely does a high CO2 temporarily actually cause any problem at all, especially mm. under anesthesia where, you know, we're there watching every single variable, every beat of the heart, every, you know, two minute, two and a half minutes, usually blood pressure, et cetera. And so yep. when I think of this, a lot of times this doesn't matter too much, but when it does matter, it really yep. matters. And, you know, yes. I'm thinking of those circumstances where, you know, recently I had a patient with pulmonary artery pressures of 80, you know, severe pulmonary hypertension. I thought, you know, if there's any time I'm going to keep CO2 absolutely normal, it's, it's, it's this case or yes. so, you know, severe pulmonary hypertension or intracranial pathology where you don't want the ICP to rise, or maybe just yes. severe metabolic disturbances, severe cardiac dysfunction. I just want my CO2 not to be doing anything adverse to this human being. Um, but those are the rare occasions. Most of the time, ah, CO2, 60, should be right. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, and so for like for the normal patient, how how high would you allow your CO2 to, to go? And I, I can be honest with you, I'm I'm you know, I'll, I'll go first because so that uh, won't sort of put you in a bind. But I'm let's, happy let's, for it. let's put a disclaimer right right here that <laughs> you know it, it's it's hard to know how it's one of those things where it's odd because we I think we both practice reason, reasonably similarly. And I think yeah. we're gonna well, right now we're both gonna say, you know, LMA patient well analgies should probably have a co2 above 45 you know oh, absolutely and yeah they, and i'm, I'm goes, happy even if it's like in the 60s do you know yeah. so and, and we know that again to justify this i've definitely had patients oh, again it's, it's so weird talking on a podcast you know saying this information but like um, you know we've all had patients who've had co2s climb maybe they've been over analgies but what do you do you don't give them naloxone that's not the mm. right thing to do. You just, they, they wake up, they, they, they wash out the CO2, they go back to normal and you monitor them. They're not narcotized. There's lots of safety built into it. And they're not the ICP patient, severe yes. pulmonary hypertensive, metabolic and cardiac derangement. So there's a lot of thing that goes into this, but in an LMA patient breathing spontaneously, they will be, you know, they'll be okay. We, we know, that's right. We know this from the data of severe lung disease, asthmatics, their CO2s necessarily climb to huge amounts because you can't mm. ventilate them for risk of the more you know more pressing things which is barotrauma gas trapping um, and you're just trying to preserve oxygenation and um yeah so now you've got a problem where you can't get the co2 down and these patients tolerate high co2s permissive hypercapnia is a absolutely is a thing. Mm. yeah and and you know that's why patients with primary hypertension or even with um uh, as you say intracranial pathology it it's always a tube for me, for those patients, I, you know, cause you want to control the ventilation and you want to be able to control the SCO2 uh, to a, to a normal level to avoid any adverse effects in terms of their pulmonary pressures, as well as their cerebral blood flow as well. Yes. And, you know, for those patients, yeah, I, I, I don't know about you, but I always, I always uh, use, if, if I'm going to use any opioids, short acting opioids uh, mm. for those patients yes. or, you know, if they're having, I guess if they're having major abdominal surgery, which makes it a lot tricky, mm. then, you know, either regional techniques or even consideration that, you know, that I possibly won't be able to extubate them. Yes. Uh, Post-op. Yeah. You want to be so careful. Yep. <laughs> so, um, actually, now, so these next two yeah. points are a little bit interesting because I think the main part of the answer is though what we've just talked about, but... Mm. I was actually going to get your thoughts on this because, you know, these are from my notes, but carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and tissue blood flow as the, um, as, as a kind of, kind of smaller factors. I'm, I'm not going to put a lot of emphasis on this, but mm. you know, if you give a acetazolamide, then oh, you theoretically, would, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You'd but, uh, but, I, but, the, but the point I think I would, uh, mm. yeah. So you've got acetazolamide as one. And just, I think, explain to the audience how acetazolamide would increase your CO2. Yeah, so let's say it's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. So you, you know, essentially it's slowing HCO3 production in the red blood cell. There, you know, decreased diffusion across the red blood cell membrane. So now, you know, the fact that normally you'd have lots of bicarbonate, uh, you know, be a buffer and be, a, I guess, a reservoir of CO2 um, and account for a lot of this arteriovenous difference. If you're, you know, essentially uh, blocking the carbonic, carbon, carbonic anhydrase enzyme, then you're not going to get as much of the shift as bicarbonate. Therefore, you might get an increase in your arterial CO2. Yep, yep. And I, I think I'll put a caveat to that because mm. they, they certainly use that um, when you go up to altitude mm. in order to counteract altitude sickness in order to make sure that um, you've got adequate ventilation. Mm. And I think that's sort of the key thing 
is that if you have someone who's awake, and as you sort of mentioned before, um, that the CO2 peripheral chemoreceptors as well as the central chemoreceptors are so finely in tune to your CO2 that they're able to keep your CO2 uh, levels normal. So this would, I think, certainly the use of acetazolamide in someone who's got fixed ventilation, you would definitely see, yeah, a rise in terms of your mixed uh, spina CO2. Because, yep. you know, with CO2 carriage, 60% of that is through bicarbonate. And if, you are, if you're blocking that with acetazolamide, that is a massive amount of um, CO2 that's not being able to be carried and therefore has to exist uh, as a in a dissolved state as and exist as a partial pressure. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. And so the next point I've got here, tissue blood flow. So I, I can see conceptually uh, where this idea comes from. So I, I think the idea comes from that, uh, let's say you've got a, let's say you've got a fixed amount of CO2 being produced, which is 200 mils per minute. And then I think the idea is that um, in a normal state, you've got five liters per minute. Mm. But in, in, let's say, a patient who undergoes some form of uh, cardiogenic shock and is not able to have that same amount of cardiac output, so that reduces to, mm. let's say, half, two and a half liters per minute. But you're still producing 200 mm. mils of CO2 per minute, mm. yeah? And I think what I think what that is saying is that um, that amount of CO2 needs to exist in that two and a half liters of blood. And theoretically, that would mean that the um, CO2 content per deciliter would increase. And therefore, you would see a rise in your CO2. So yeah, I can, I can certainly see that. And, and look, I think that um, you know, in states of cardiogenic shock, I would say that patients do have, do have a rise in their... Um, Mm. in their mixed venous CO2. Yeah, and so some, something worth mentioning. Tissue blood flow yep. can cause a potential rise. If it decreased tissue blood flow, you still get an increase, you still get the same amount of CO2 production with decreased mm. blood flow. So you may get a rise because it's not being you know, uh, distributed. The CO2 is not being right. pushed out around the circulation as fast. And, 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 there's, and there's obviously a caveat with the increase in tissue blood flow because you know, with tissue blood flow, it is so well auto-regulated yes. uh, both myogenically and metabolically as mm -hmm. well so that you know out of and what we're talking about is an artificial rise in your in your in your tissue in your cardiac output or in your tissue blood flow by whatever mechanism you know either pharmacologically or primarily pharmacologically so much so that you know you double your cardiac output mm -hmm. but your co2 production remains the same mm -hmm. and therefore what you would see is you you know, as you correctly described, I guess you would see a, a reduction in the amount of CO2 content per deciliter, which would reduce the partial pressure of CO2. So that makes sense. Yeah. Mm, sounds good. And finally, you got one last one. This is this is this is like this is like the uh, the point to give you the five out of five on your on your answer. Yeah, that's right. So you know, like like with anything, we're talking about con content is the number that's I guess the first variable in the body. Uh, and then the question asks about tension. And so how does content relate to tension? You can, gra you can, you can graph that. And that graph, that graph of CO2 dissociation curve also changes based on this Haldane effect. So I guess the final point is the Haldane effect may affect the you know, mixed venous tension in, uh, yeah, the venous, sorry, the CO2 tension in your mixed venous blood. So the position of that dissociation curve depends on the oxygen saturation. So potentially a change in oxygen saturation changes and moves that curve, so your CO2 tension changes. So again, pretty sim simple concept, related back to a graph, show how it might shift, and then hopefully you get your five points and you pass the exam. Done, beautiful. Done. That Good. was a great discussion, and I think uh, a great summary of how to approach a question related to the factors affecting mixed venous CO2. Mm, absolutely, so you know, again, once you've listened to this podcast, Try to get that format, normal values, measurement, draw the equation, CO2 is proportional to production over ventilation, and then just write out the factors for ventilation, production, and maybe a couple of extra things like the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and tissue blood flow and the graph of the Haldane effect. And uh, yeah, you know, best thing as well, teach someone, just get, get, get on a whiteboard. I remember one of my favorite things of doing this was just write stuff out on a whiteboard, pretend like you're teaching someone, and then actually teach someone and then hopefully they get something out of it, you get something out of it and you memorize this stuff a whole lot better. Fantastic. Right.
So um, I think that's enough for this episode. So let's call that a wrap. Thanks very much, Stan, for all your expertise and your questioning. And we will see you guys for the next episode. Thanks very much for watching and listening. And yeah, uh, please uh, share this with anyone who might be interested in really interesting first part physiology.